Tap into a whole new world of financial possibilities. Genie, get it to get it. Staying ahead in the competitive and chaotic business world is all about the three P's. Preparation, preparation, and preparation. Here in Biznomics is where we intend to prepare you for tomorrow's challenges today. I'm Thavindu Amrasekara, and welcome to your weekend's most profitable 60 minutes. This is Biznomics. Esports, e-gaming, one might even think, is that even an industry? Are we really spending an episode talking about it? But did you know? that this is an industry estimated to be valued at more than $1 billion worldwide. And in fact, growing at a compounded annual growth rate of more than 20%. Even in Sri Lanka, eSports is some serious business. But how well are you aware about it? Today, we intend to prepare you to be knowing more about this industry so that should the opportunity arise, you too could be a part of this flourishing business. And we have with us today as our special guest, Ravin Vijay Tilaka, the founder president of Sri Lanka Esports Association and also the founder of Gamer.lk. Ravin, welcome to Biznomics. Absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you, Tarin, for having me. Ravin, let's get to the crux of the matter. Now, we've actually, at least speaking for myself, I've been in that generation where the parents always told us, get away from the computer games, stop playing those computer games. That was a echoing, rumbling, uh, message that used to echo inside our homes. I think sure. this is a common case for a lot of young people and even today. But eSports seems to be quite a big business. How big is this market worldwide? And what are the different categories of this spectrum? Demystify it. And let me tell you, with that outlook of yours, you look like straight out of Counter-Strike. <laughs> thank, thank you for agreeing for the get up. Um, so uh, to your point of what is eSports and how it relates to what parents are um, talking about and even I came from a generation, I grew up in a ger generation where my parents were you know, very careful about how much time I spent on the video games as well as studies and so on. Tell and me, did you have, do you have the experience of shutting the computer and running away when you hear them coming sometimes because of playing of the course. games? Of course. I think all <laughs> of us have, right, at some point. And that applies to not only video games, any sort of entertainment um, aspect that we want to get into. Um, we, we've had that experience as children. But um, speaking about esports specifically, I think it's growing in a way that is very similar to how cricket grew in Sri Lanka. So once upon a time, you'd have your parents uh, tell you don't go out and play cricket. It's, uh, you should be doing your studies, you should be concentrating on studies. And so they were discouraging people playing sports and they were really encouraging kids to study. stay inside, study, do well in your uh, exams. Yes. And so today with cricket you know, being the number one sport in the country, uh, parents seeing you can actually go out and make a career out of it. It's, yeah. With so it's many national no, leagues. Absolutely. And it's no more taboo that your, if your child is a professional cricketer, it's something that they would encourage. Correct. And esports is going along those same sort of lines uh, as a sport as well as as an industry. So if you look at esports as an industry, I'll, um, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to video games. Video games has a huge spectrum of what video games is. So at the center, you have the actual game, the game that you play either on a PC, on a mobile phone. Uh, how that is created? is a whole bunch of industries coming together. So you have the actual developers. So those are the guys who sit in front of a computer. They code. Uh, the designers will create art around it. And um, there's that entire software development life cycle that goes around that. Then you will move on to publishers and distributors. They will work with distribution platforms. Like um, if you're a PC gamer, there is Steam. Uh, there is Epic Games. You all might see Epic Games and Apple these days. There's a big... Uh, sort of a toss out between the, these two publishers because they're both platforms that distribute games. Then you move more towards the marketing side of things. Um, a game is not going to really succeed until it's, uh, unless it's marketed properly. Correct. And then you can actually uh, create community and sport around games. So what is and Ravin, correct me if I'm wrong, but we also see sometimes brand advertising within some of these games. Absolutely. So... Um, Video games today is one of the fastest growing 
um, uh, content creation platforms in the sense there are more people watching video game content between the ages of 18 and uh, 25 than there are people uh, watching traditional sports content. So just think about that for a second. <clears throat> um, in a survey conducted between people 18 to 25, they watch 77% more video game content. So that is live streams, video content created around games, around tournaments. 77% uh, more video game content than they watch traditional sports content. So they are talking about the cricket and the rugger and the football and so on. And so that is the trend moving forward. The younger generation, um, they are more into the video game content and the cricket and the soccer and all of those are. That has a generation that is really um, you know, dedicated to it, but the numbers don't lie. And um, that is what we are sort of stepping in and preparing Sri Lanka for. When the globe, when the world goes along with esports, we want to make sure that Sri Lanka is Not along there. Behind. Exactly. Some uh, very interesting opening insights there, Ravin. <laughs> let's talk about the potential for this in um, Sri Lanka. I mean, let's say in a Sri Lankan context, how serious business is gaming? Sure. So, uh, again, if you take esports, esports is the competitive play of video games that I explained. So, um, there are teams. Basically, any game, but played at a competitive, maybe more organized professional level. Absolutely. And are there professional gamers in Sri Lanka whose job is like playing games? Right. So I'm, I'm getting to that. So yes. we are on the path to that. There are a few people who have succeeded. Just like any other sport, you need to be really good and that top tier uh, skill set in order to make any money doing what uh, you do. Mm. Um, same with esports. So esports is the competitive play of video games. It doesn't mean that you can stay at home. Uh, you know, if you play eight hours a day, but you don't practice it to go to a tournament and actually compete, that doesn't mean you're a professional gamer. A professional gamer is someone who will get paid for either competing in tournaments, for representing some sort of esports organization. We have several esports organizations in Sri Lanka, uh, or even internationally. Um, or you can be a content streamer, a game streamer. So there are platforms like Facebook, YouTube, that actually even in Sri Lanka pay streamers who have great streaming personalities or their skill set is so high that the content they create and they put out on Facebook. While playing the game. While playing the game. This is all gaming content. The content that they stream, people, like thousands and thousands of people want to watch it. So there are, of course, different categories. Some people are very humorous. Some people are uh, really good at the game. And so people want to watch their skill set. And some people are dancing. Some people are dancing, exactly. And that's a business in itself, right? Uh, globally, if you actually look at the game streaming concept, you have all of these different, different, different categories. It's so vast. Um, you will have at least a few thousand people falling into these categories. Sri Lanka is just getting into that, so that's why we We're see... Just getting a feel of it. Just getting a feel of it. That's why you see one person just dancing and going viral. We are going to have many more moving forward um, if, you are look at, if you are to look at the global scene. Understood. Yeah. Uh, Ramin, uh, when we talk about this new trend we see of mobile gaming, I mean, we, I would also like you to touch upon some of the famous games which are there. I mean, we hear words like Counter-Strike, Fortnite, and um, you know, PUBG, etc. What are the games that have really uh, caught on, and especially the mobile gaming now? Smaller devices, limited uh, functionality in terms of the battery capacity, etc. What are the dynamics of uh, mobile gaming? Tarino, before I answer that question, let's actually look at how a region within the world decides what games get popular and what games uh, you know, aren't as popular. So Sri Lanka has a GDP per capita of about 3,900, 3,800 USD. Um, compared to that, something like North America, I think, has about 60,000, 65,000 uh, GDP per capita. So what that means is the expendable income that someone, a consumer or a gamer has in North America um, is much, much higher than someone in Sri Lanka, obviously. And what that means is the type of device that they are able to purchase compared to someone in Sri Lanka, this is on a mass scale, um, is much higher. So they Absolutely. are able to spend more, which means they have a higher, uh, basically PCs versus mobile is what we're trying to get to. That's the equilibrium we are trying to balance here. That's right. So in Sri Lanka, you'll see um, the PC gamer market is very much limited to the urban areas, whereas the rest of the country, like 15 million or so people, are more mobile gamers. So anyone who um, gets a mobile into their hand potentially has 
um, the, uh, access to games that they can download onto their phone. They're not necessarily going to spend 300,000, 400,000 rupees on a high-end gaming PC to start gaming, but they will already have their smartphone on their, um, in their pocket and they will use that for games. And so... And I believe we, there are some uh, mobile phones which are coming with certain special processors which helps them to do gaming better. Absolutely. So that is a huge segment, globally a huge segment of when a, a mobile device manufacturer is targeting uh, all of these segments. Gaming and the processor that is required to cater to that segment is a huge, huge part of both their marketing and their research and development. Yeah, so um, based on where you live, so South Asia, mobile gaming is huge. Um, Southeast Asia, mobile gaming is huge. China, uh, mobile gaming is huge. So therefore, you will see the type of games that are played in these regions are slightly different. When I say on a, on a mass scale, it's slightly different from what North America and Europe play. So this is actually something, uh, as a tournament organizer in Sri Lanka who's uh, been involved in the esports scene since 2007, we were looking at North America and Europe and trying to sort of mimic them. And we understood the same sort of numbers that North America were seeing, we weren't seeing in Sri Lanka, purely because there's a little bit of a mismatch on the type of games we play. The affordability. Affordability and um, access. So a game that would be $20, $30 would be nothing for a North American. Yeah. But in Sri Lanka, that's about 6,000, 7,000 rupees. And um, whereas the most popular games in Sri Lanka today are games like PUBG Mobile, Free Fire, Call of Duty Mobile, where it's free to download. So it's the freemium model. Freemium model. Yeah. So, um, if you uh, look at uh, numbers wise, and I believe Southeast Asia also, you know, especially the likes of Singapore, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, these countries are quite strong in uh, mobile games as well. And in terms of the total numbers worldwide, uh, Ravin, how, how many are we looking at? I mean, I know it's, a, it's quite a vague question, I'm sure, but from your understanding, from what you've seen, when you look at Sri Lanka and worldwide, on average, uh, let's say when there are tournaments organized, how many numbers do we see in Sri Lanka and worldwide, roughly how many esports professional players are there? On a, you know, maybe a ballpark figure. Sure. Um, so globally, there is an audience of about 800 million who are considered um, esports enthusiasts and casual viewers. So these yeah, are 800 million. 800 million. But that's yeah. still more than 10% of the global population. Absolutely. And it's growing. It's growing steadily of about 20% year on year. Um, and in Sri Lanka, according to certain estimates, we have about 4 million people who are interested in video games. Um, and then it will be a subset of that who will be watching the streams, uh, watching the tournament streams, and then a s smaller subset of that who will be actually taking part in tournaments. So uh, there is about a million people, for example, who have downloaded PUBG Mobile as a game. Mm. Um, then, uh, so if you look at those numbers, of course, it's, it's very much like cricket, right? Um, if you take the national team, for example, there's about 24 people who will be selected for a national team, but millions and millions of people who are watching them as spectators. All a part of the ecosystem. Absolutely. And so that's what we actually pride ourselves as being. We are esports ecosystem builders. So we have to look at each part of the esports ecosystem and to make sure that each part of it is sustained and grows. So that is including the players who actually take part and compete as well as the spectator. So there's a whole broadcast and production aspect to it, as well as, you know, all of the surrounding support industries from production to um, platform development to refereeing and administration and um, even just social media, just making sure the word of esports is out there and people are aware that esports is happening. So as you correctly said, some people, they earn money by... Uh, going and participating in certain platforms and streaming their performances. Some people, I believe they get uh, donations for, like when other people watch them playing the game and if they are happy with it, they might make a donation. Yeah. Uh, now, I've also seen sometimes people uh, on the internet, like say on Facebook, they are live stream a ga streaming a game they are playing that, which looks to be, you know, having the, a certain uh, pink color buses similar to the Sri Lankan buses you get and they are speaking in Sinhalese and they have a good... Uh, live viewer base as well. Are some of these games that people play online, are they made in Sri Lanka? And when will we see a Sri Lankan made game going global, Ravin? Right. So great question. Um, most of the games that are streamed by Sri Lankans are developed globally, um, North American or European 
developers who will develop the game, but then Sri Lankans take it and modify it. Okay. So they will make it completely Sri Lankan. For example, the pink buses you were talking about, um, there is not a developer in North America who understands the Sri Lankan market no like way. that. <laughs> but it is definitely Sri Lankan ingenuity that really takes that concept, yes. mods it. We call it modding. Modding. And they will modify the vehicle to look like a bus. They will modify the vehicle to look like you know Sri Lankan buses. Maybe tuk-tuks. Maybe um, within the map there might be Sri Lankan icons like the Nilam Kulan and all. And so then they will stream that to a Sri Lankan audience, they'll speak in singular mm. uh, because it's a mass market sort of correct, appeal. Correct. Mass market has caught on. Let's uh, agree on that, I believe. I mean, the mass market has really been interested in this and we see even on Facebook a huge interest. Correct. Some good points there. Uh, we are going to come back to you on more detail on that, uh, Ravin, after this break. Stay tuned. We will be back after this short break. This is Biznomics. <laughs> Tap into a whole new world of financial possibilities. Genie, get it to get it. The world of esports. That is our focus, and that's the game we are playing today here in Biznomics. I'm Tarindu Amrasekar, and joining me is Ravin Vijayatilaka. Ravin, now when we talk about uh, esports and people doing it or playing esports as a profession to make money, to make a living out of it, how much money are we really looking at? Because it kind of still feels a little weird to think people can actually make a living out of it. But you are saying, no, people are making a living out of it, especially globally. And even in Sri Lanka, a few people are doing it. But roughly how much um, money are we looking at? And let's talk some numbers once again, Sri Lanka and worldwide. And maybe not just the income, but even some of these torn tournament price money we are, which we are seeing is unbelievable. Sure. So let's start globally. So that's where the esports market is most mature at the at yeah, the uh, That's where moment. the trends are set. That's right. Um, so in terms of prize money that you brought up, um, just to give some context, the ICC World Cup, Cricket World Cup, has about a $10 million prize pool. Um, this year, the Dota 2 International, so Dota 2 is a um, video game uh, played competitively. It's an esport. Uh, it has a tournament called the International, and that has a $40 million prize pool. Get away. Are you serious? That's right. So the, the gamers and the esports athletes who actually take part and win this are millionaires, dollar millionaires. Overnight. Overnight. Of course, when we say overnight, we mean because they won the tournament. Yes. But this is um, a, a, a years and years of preparation and correct, a correct. business model and but investment. But just like a sport, isn't it? I mean, Absolutely. you might have had a horrid uh, World Cup in 2003, but... 2000 and what, uh, maybe 2015, you might go on to win the World Cup. Absolutely. So because there are such high prize pools and large prize pools at stake, there's an in entire industry and investment going into these teams that are participating. So you can look at it from any angle. You can invest or create a team, um, build that brand, very similar to like a franchise, like even if you look at the NBA, you have these franchises being invested in. Um, it will be valued at a certain amount, and then they will sell it at a profit uh, at some point when they have built that brand. That same concept exists for esports. So you have these global esports team brands that make huge investments into their players, and we're talking about coaching, um, psychology, that just making sure that uh, they are mentally prepared for the big stage because we have $40 million on the line, right? So there's a big investment going into this. When you go towards the salary side, it can, um, it can be based on contracts. So we can easily go into the millions of dollars for a player to be signed into an esports organization. If you go into uh, North America, uh, a mid-tier esports athlete would be making about $5,000 uh, per month. So that's about a million rupees or more per month, easily just taking part in competitions uh, and tournaments. If you move more towards the South Asian scene, uh, we are still getting there. So um, one would have to find the ideal uh, esports organization that is willing to invest and uh, give you a salary. And so you would have to um, really be able to up your skill level as well as represent that brand. So you'll have to stream, you'll have to win tournaments. And we're talking about lakhs, right? In, in terms of salary, 100, 200, 300,000 per month. Ravin, let's admit, uh, 
some uh, graduates from universities are getting only around 50 70000 <laughs> absolutely i mean it's it's a big industry but in order to again we, what yeah, you have to of understand course. Is, you you have to it's, it's not overnight that's right and you have to dedicate yourself uh, just make sure that you are the best in your field otherwise someone's going to bump you off and so that let's say 300000 rupee salary is going to be uh, taken by whoever is better than you absolutely very similar to any other sport so it's all about those opportunities. So in addition to that, there are sponsorship opportunities. You can stream, like you mentioned. So let's uh, get into the streaming side of things. So we are talking about competing all this time. But you can be a content creator. So if you, for example, get on Facebook, if you hit a certain number of watch hours per month, Facebook is going to give you a dedicated uh, payment for reaching those. And so they have been doing this. And so there are platforms like Twitch and um, YouTube Gaming that have already signed on large content creators globally. One example is Ninja. I don't know whether you have uh, understood. I'm not a very <laughs> prolific game, but I've been following it, but no, I haven't heard of it. He has been on the, uh, the front cover of ESPN magazine and so oh, on. Wow. Okay. So he was given a contract, I think it is a two-year contract, with a streaming platform called Mixer. It is by Microsoft. Okay. And that was $10 million straight up. For, for that year? For the, I think it is about two years uh, contract. Still? Two years, ten million dollars. Take that. This contract. is just for doing what he normally does anyway, but yeah. do it only on our platform. Okay. Uh, that is just you know that's the battle between the streaming platforms where Twitch was by the way um, acquired by Amazon. Yeah. Uh, Facebook is Facebook, yeah. and YouTube uh, has started their own YouTube gaming. So from the streaming side of things, Facebook is actually making a big leap in Sri Lanka, where they are paying Sri Lankan content creators to make sure that all of our eyeballs are on Facebook and not so much on YouTube or on uh, Twitch. Understood. So people are making money. These uh, Shashi Nishadis um, that you mentioned earlier about the dancing, um, they're making uh, decent money doing what they do, entertaining people. Yeah. Whether you agree with it or whether you don't agree with it, there is an ecosystem building here. Right. Well, I mean, at the end of the day, as long as there is nothing illegal happening, I believe freedom of expression should be respected. Uh, I, and I strongly believe that we as a nation needs to go beyond the, the notion that everything has to fit in a defined framework. I think it's high time we as a nation started accepting different and tolerating uh, different ideas and different ideologies because that's the only way a nation can grow, Ravin. Am I right to say that? Absolutely. So this particular topic of um, game streaming, there have been multiple, multiple different categories that have already got popular globally, which means you have seen the dancers and the, you, know, you, you donate, someone is going to do something for the person who has donated. Uh, and within the game streaming space, that is that has become normal. It just happened very recently in Sri Lanka. Correct. And it's a very different market as well, isn't it? I mean, because you're looking at um, all of a sudden a market that, let's say, even 5,000 people or 10,000 people on a Facebook page at night from 11 o'clock. I mean, that's a very active market that is uh, very busily attached to that particular segment. And maybe brands also have to find a way to connect with them. Absolutely. Uh, so so we, are, we are going to discuss on the monetizing aspects later there. Let's talk about uh, the role of an esports uh, association. Now, you are from the Sri Lanka Esports Association. Uh, what is the association's role in promoting uh, esports in Sri Lanka? And most importantly, how does it work? Because I'm quite sure with esports being recognized as an official sport in Sri Lanka and all these official tournaments being there, the ministry is also, I'm sure, having a keen eye on things. And there must be ministry approvals and so much of uh, coordination to happen. Tell us all about that. What happens behind the screen? Sure. So we um, we formed the uh, Sri Lanka Esports Association back in uh, 2010, where we saw all of these different esports organized. And at that point, it is of course fairly small. But we saw all these very passionate but fractured organizations uh, working separately. And so we basically approached them and said. Uh, why don't we all sort of combine under one banner? We can have a national ranking. Everyone works together. And so everyone was on board. And so that's how the Sri Lanka Esports Association came to be. I'm one of the founding uh, members. Congratulations on that. Thank you very much. And um, so at that time, we knew that for esports to grow in Sri Lanka or even in the region, there had to be a very strong private enterprise push in uh, hand with like government endorsement plus governance. That's where the role the Sri Lanka Esports Association plays. And the in-game um, entertainment, my private company, is what 
um, is, is the role that plays the private enterprise side of things. So Gamer.lk will organize all these large scale tournaments, help brands connect with uh, gamers and so on. So we are a, very much an esports agency, whereas the Sri Lanka Esports Association is a member of the International Esports Federation. Nice. We, um, um, we send esports athletes to international tournaments with the blessing of the sports ministry. For example, the Asian Games in 2018, we worked with the sports ministry as well as the National Olympic Committee uh, in order to choose Sri Lanka's best esports athletes where they will represent the country and they actually got national colors and it is like officially signed off by the ministry. And so that is where esports is heading in terms of a sport. It is, uh, it is of course the fastest growing sport in Sri Lanka as well as globally. And the ministry is helping us um, sort of steer it towards a legitimate sporting category. Interesting to hear that. Let's uh, talk about um, the role that the government needs to play in further strengthening esports in Sri Lanka. In your view, maybe the sports ministry needs to have need, ministry needs to have a proper policy and a, maybe a proper direction. Ravin, what does the government need to do to make sure that esports flourishes in Sri Lanka even further? Because the way I see it, this is not only limited to Colombo and maybe the developed cities. Esports is uh, one would say flourishing in leaps and bounds across all geographies in Sri Lanka. Am I right to say that? That's right. And yeah. if so, what policy decisions and what action should the government take to really make sure this industry flourishes? Sure. So the role of the sports ministry isn't to sort of get directly involved in the sport and make decisions on behalf of the association. What the sports ministry will do is they will enable the association in charge of that sport to make sure they um, grow the sport in a uh, measured way. In a, in a planned way. So at the moment, what we're doing with the sports ministry is, um, of course, the sports ministry has established the National Sports Council that decides you know, which sports go into which tiers. For example, there's tier one sports that will um, probably have medal prospects at the Olympics and the Asian Games and so on. And then there are tiers two sports and tier three sports and so on. So our responsibility from the Sri Lanka Esports Association is to make the argument that we will fit into one of those top tiers. Once we are fit into those one of those tiers, what happens is we will then work with the sports ministry, with the National Sports Council, to make sure that our vision for esports is backed by the sports ministry. So when you say vision, we just want to make sure that Sri Lankan esports athletes have the talent, the training, um, and the support, both monetarily as well as you know products and um, side support like that to make sure they represent the country and are able to um, really put on a good show uh, when it comes to th them representing the country at international tournaments. So that is sort of the relationship that the sports association has with the sports ministry. Interesting. Now, if you are a brand, how can you monetize the opportunities from these esports? Let's talk about that on the other side of this short break. This is Biznomics. Welcome back to Biznomics, your weekend's most profitable 60 minutes. Our focus today is on the esports industry in Sri Lanka and also worldwide. The potential, the problems, and the way forward. And we are in conversation with Ravin Vijay Tilaka. Ravin, let's talk about from the brand's viewpoint because businesses are seeing the action happening. Mm -hmm. They are wondering how can I get my brand to be a part of the action. The way you see it, what are the monetizing or what are the opportunities? for brands to be a part of this action? To get, is it to get exposure? Uh, is it to be uh, able to directly sell some of the items, like the digital versions, etc.? What are the business opportunities that you see? Sure. So, I mean, it depends on what type of brand you are. For example, if you're an investment company looking into getting into the esports space, um, this uh, pandemic period has seen so many people basically staying indoors and getting digitally involved in all sorts of digital um, entertainment uh, aspects, right? But you can't play on the outside, you play inside. Exactly. And so in terms of the video game market, it has seen a huge uptick of uh, people uh, spending more time on their games as well as making purchases within their games. So, so it has making purchases, like if I'm playing a game, maybe I got the game free, but I can buy an outfit. 
And can that outfit be from a famous clothing brand, for example? It can. So, for example, um, uh, you, the game itself is free to download. Yeah. It's called the freemium model. Freemium right? it's free, model. free to download, but there can be a skin or a, a weapon or a energy drink that someone can pull out and basically drink that in-game. Yes. And then you get X amount of more Life health, on that. Um, or you can run faster. Okay. And so there, there are many opportunities for brand engagement that happens within a game, as well as uh, what we are doing with brands these days are we are helping them connect with in-game advertising. So the, the fact is that this many eyeballs are now on video games. So they are always in front of their phones or their PCs playing these games. The brand's responsibility is how do we get our brand in an engaging way, in an authentic, engaging way in front of all these eyeballs that are now in front of video games. Yeah. And so what we do as an organization is we help uh, brands integrate into games, either through video game streaming or we speak to the developers themselves and get the brand associated inside it. For example, if it's an e-cricket game, yes. the jerseys can be branded, the, the, you know, the, the ground can be branded with those brands. And so that is both direct and indirect brand engagement. Another um, thing that we do is we organize uh, eSports tournaments under the brand name of certain, certain, certain brands. Understood. So what happens is people associate their favorite games with these brands. So the next time they're out uh, in the supermarket or wherever, they connect a, with the brand. making a brand deci uh, buying decision, uh, it's top of mind, right? They just took part in a tournament and yeah. uh, that, that decision is easy to make. Ravin, on a side note, uh, what's your favorite game and how many hours do you spend for a week playing the game? So my, my prime time in gaming has uh, long left me. But these days, uh, a game that I played was Last of Us. Last, Last of, of Us 2. It's on PS4. Uh, very much story driven. And so that's the beauty of games, right? It's not all just mindless action. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. a story to be told. So it is, uh, if the game is developed well, it is very much a story that you can live interactively. Your advice to anyone who is planning to develop a story, who is watching this program and thinking, look, you know what, maybe I want to, I have a software company, I, I want to get into making games. Because nowadays we also have this concept of gamification. If you're good in making games, you can make gaming-based training programs and all that for companies. Your advice to anybody who is thinking of making their own games, what would you tell them? Figure out what your goals are, first and foremost. If you want it mass market, there are certain, certain things you need to hit perfectly. Accessibility of the actual game, um, whether it can be played, whether it's free or not, and so on. If you're out there to tell a story specifically, then it's all about the medium of you know, how you tell that story. Um, is it going to be through video or is it going to be through uh, RPG? There are several, several genres of games that you can get into. Um, if it's monetization, that's a whole different ballpark you need to uh, mm -hmm. sort of get into. You need to understand exactly there's a segment of people who will play completely free. Mm. There's a segment of people who will download it, spend a certain amount of money, and then get rid of it. There's another small segment who's going to spend much more than if you were going to sell the game, uh, who will pay uh, with in-game items. So, I mean, it, it's, it all depends on what you want to actually develop and get going. And, um, with that, and, and from then, what you said earlier, also find people who would be willing to play the game and maybe stream it, and that way you get more attention as well. Absolutely. So that's another thing that we're doing these days. So we are working with a couple of uh, local game developers and distributing their game to the, some of the top streamers. Uh, in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka. So um, what that happens is there's actually a, a game just being released uh, um, in the next couple of days. By Good the luck time. with that, yeah. yes. Um, and so what, what happens is there are thousands and thousands of people who are watching these streamers play. And they want access to the games that these guys play. Yeah, so they see the streamer playing and then they want to buy it. Absolutely. So we call them KOLs or key opinion leaders. Uh, and their opinion matters. What game they play matters. Uh, let's talk about the impact on the on this sector from the pandemic. I know we mentioned this in passing earlier, but how did you see the game, especially, let's say, among the mass markets, uh, especially in Sri Lanka, and maybe even worldwide too, the games getting adopted? Did we see um, an unusual growth? Because you are in the front row. You are seeing the action happening, uh, Ravin. What was the impact from the pandemic on the esports industry? Sure. So um, the, the effect on esports was mixed, and I'll explain why I'm saying it's mixed. Esports is very much event 
driven mm. concept, right? It's an experience. Experience. It's an experience. Yeah. There are big stages, like even us uh, pre-pandemic, we were organizing sort of large scale events like the Sri Lanka Cyber Games, where you'd have 10,000 people walk in over three days. Wow. Um, and it was like a festival atmosphere, right? And people in cosplay. So it's very much that fe festival uh, concept that we had going. And so what happens in the pandemic is all of these physical events, obviously called off, canceled, and everything moves online. Even though things can flourish online, um, that experience you get from a physical event where you see your favorite people on stage taking part, uh, being able to meet them and the jerseys and everything, is the, that experience is slightly different from what you see like of someone taking part from home. Right. And so, and it, are there like recognized gaming celebrities in Sri Lanka within the gaming community as well? So that is, short answer is yes, okay. but not enough. So that is kind of something that we are doing these days. For example, we are organizing the eSports Premier League. It's a franchise yes. league. And we have actually partnered with six uh, local cricketing legends. So we have Angelo Matthew, Chamin Davas, uh, Russell Arnold, Sanajay Surya, mm. Lasit Malinga, uh, Tilakaratna Deshan, who have all connected with different franchise leagues, in this, uh, franchise teams in this league. My question is also, uh, among the people who play these games, the, the gamers, are there like gaming celebrities sure. uh, that the so, gaming community recognizes? Got it. So uh, that is what we are trying to do by connecting these celebrities to it. Right. We are trying to shine a light on these guys. So for example, Lasit Malinga's Khandurata Kings yeah. um, will get a much bigger visibility. And then, so that the players in that will also get more visibility. Absolutely right. So that, that's why we are trying to connect these local legend celebrities to these esports And that's a good strategy players. as well. That's the idea. So we just started it this year. We've had the Esports Premier League since 2020, yeah. where the finals was actually held at Stein Studios. It was a big uh, production uh, streamed um, uh, online as well. And so this year we're having it completely online. online. Because of the given pandemic. Because of the pandemic. And so we are going to build it into this big production uh, concept where we have these celebrities um, normal celebrities, not esports celebrities, who are joining these teams, mm. shining a light on them and uh, giving them visibility. More like taking a hybrid approach towards the branding. I think that's a good method. That's right. Let's talk about the technologies which you are expecting to reshape the esports industry over the next few years. Sure. What are the people, now, nowadays we talk about virtual reality, we talk about augmented reality and uh, so on. The, the devices are getting more powerful and stronger. Uh, and there's a lot of investment happening into areas like AI in gaming, VR. What is the role that you see all these technologies playing in esports, uh, Ravin, moving forward? Sure. So before we sort of get into the far future of augmented reality and virtual reality, what will immediately happen is technology uh, gets smaller and cheaper. And that will play a huge role in these developing worlds like Sri Lanka and um, South Asia. The Moore's Law. Yes. Um, by the way, Moore's law very, very dated now. <laughs> no longer, no longer relevant. Okay. Uh, because it's it's multiplying at much bigger Fast rates now. Rates. Yeah. Um, and but but the point is. But the technology is, keeps getting cheaper and smaller. Exactly. So cheaper, especially when it gets smaller, it gets cheaper, and uh, so that plays a huge role in more Sri Lankans getting devices that can actually take part in games. So we still have a segment that are on those small, you know, Java phones. The, the dumb phones, we call it, right? You have the smartphone segment and the dumb phones and uh, feature phones. And so we want everyone in Sri Lanka who has an interest in gaming to be able to afford some sort of device that can play a game. And so when that happens, I think uh, we'll be in a good place to really unearth the best uh, Sri Lankan esports talent. So if you go into a little bit of the software side of things, yes, AI, um, is a huge part of it. Already we are seeing some interesting applications of AI um, where, you know, just at, at the most simplest level, you have a game and you can actually train against uh, artificial intelligence. So you don't need other humans to take part uh, against. Um, so what that means is through machine learning, it understands your every shot, it understands your patterns, and then we'll give you <coughs> advice on how you should change that or how you should improve. When it comes to augmented reality, for example, you and I could have augmented reality headset and we could play a game of chess right on this keyboard, on, on this table, without actually having a physical uh, chessboard here. So that could be through just a pair of glasses or a headset or anything. Mm. So that, um, it, it doesn't need to be you and I across the room. It could be you 
being millions of miles away. And I would have the same sort of experience with the augmented reality. And the audience would see it as if we are playing it here. Exactly. So that technology exists. It's just that it hasn't come to a level. Both VR and augmented reality exist to a certain extent. It hasn't come to a level that is cheap enough or widespread enough for developers to really start developing games for it or for consumers to really get the headsets and the technology. So that, I think, next 10, 20 years, um, we are going to see that the technology gets ch as cheap as your mobile phone so that then you can actually take part in virtual rea reality as a normal consumer. Ramin, from your uh, perspective, uh, what are the key challenges that are preventing uh, more people from entering into this esports industry? Is it the fact that they are unable to um, offer, I mean, afford some of these devices, especially in a rural area? We see an interest, but not many people entering. Where, where is the real barrier? Sure. So awareness is one big thing. Be before we even get into the devices, um, the awareness that you have another sport in the country that will eventually, for example, the Asian Games has esports as a medal event. I think that awareness is lacking. I think a lot of people who are probably watching this also don't really understand that you can play games, bring home a medal for the country uh, by competing and representing. And so at the, at the Asian Games, what kind of a sport do they play? As so e PUBG Mobile is one. Okay. Um, Dota 2 is another one and uh, so on. So there are Street Fighter and a couple of other games like that. Right. So if you're a PUBG Mobile player or a Dota 2 player, mm. you will, if you're good enough, you will be a part of the national esports team, which is uh, run by the Sri Lanka Esports Association, and you will represent the country. And so that, um, that pathway to represent the country is something people are not aware about. And that's something, one of the biggest challenges that we have getting the word out there. And that's where we work with the sports ministry as well to make sure even at the village level, people know that, you know, your uh, PUBG mobile game that you're playing, you will be able to represent the country one day if you're good enough. Interesting thoughts. Uh, wishing you good luck with all the work that you're doing, Ravin, and may you be able to uh, grow the esports industry in Sri Lanka to further heights and perhaps, uh, you know, the next uh, Sangakara or the next uh, gold medalist Dinesh could actually be uh, from the esports uh, industry and we sincerely hope that that day is not too far away. Wishing you all the best and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. The world of esports, the potential, the way forward. This was the focus today on Biznomics. No matter what industry you may be in, your business too might be able to be a part of the esports ecosystem. And if there is somebody at home who is talented, who is interested in esports, encourage him or her because who knows, that might well just be the next sporting celebrity of our nation. I am Tanadu Amra Sekara and I will see you with the next episode of Bisnomics, your weekend's most profitable 60 minutes. Tap into a whole new world of financial possibilities. Genie, get it to get it.